We are the people of God, eager to praise, sing, and pray. Jesus calls us by saying, come and follow me. We will begin with him. Num- yeah. <laughs> now, him 51. Still speaking, God, you call us to love as you love. You call us to three great loves, to love children, to love our neighbor, and to show love for creation. This sounds so simple, yet we live in times when children suffer from poverty and exploitation. Our neighbor's families are torn apart and efforts efforts to protect our planet are reversed without forethought. So what would you have us do? You want us to be united by the Holy Spirit and inspired by God's grace to love all, welcome all, and seek justice for all. Move among your people, God, and shine your light into the darkest places. Restore hope when things seem hopeless. Make a way when there seems to be no way. And raise us up to be the best people we can be. All the glory belongs to you, O God. Hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 592.
The scripture lesson today is from Mark. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And passing along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brothers of Simon, <coughs> casting the, a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boats mending their fence mending their nets, and immediately he called them, and they left their father in the boat with the hired servants and followed him.
reaching out for someone to hold. Your love can help them, give them hope and meet their needs. Use this life, dear Savior, I will be Most holy and loving God, be with us in this time. There's a message from me to someone, but it's really a message from you. We don't always know who the message is for or how it will impact a person's life. So add power to the words, add your spirit behind everything that we say and do. Amen. So our our friends at the National Office of the United Church of Christ have come up with a new campaign and we'll be hearing more about it slipped in here and there. It won't be our major focus this year, but, but it'll be there and you'll notice it. It's called the Three Great Loves and it was in our invocation prayer today. Um, the love of children, the love of our neighbor, and the love of our planet, the love of all creation. So um, what we said in the prayer, and I'll say it again, is that they're very simple ideas, and yet they become complicated when we humans try to put them into practice. So we'll hear more and more about that as the, as the year goes on. Um, the idea is we can't just say we're the church, we have to be the church. Well, we are back in the book of Mark today, back in our comfort zone for this year in the lectionary readings. Stories in the book of Mark are usually very brief and they get right to the point. There are few descriptions and very little elaboration. Today's story is like that. Jesus is in Galilee, John the Baptist has been arrested and Jesus begins to call disciples. Now, last week, we also looked at Jesus calling disciples, some of the same disciples that we're reading this week in Mark. I haven't lost my mind completely. Um, I wanted to look at it from two points of view. Now, in the book of John, we saw that, that Jesus called Andrew first, and then he called his brother Simon, who became Peter. Then Jesus called Philip, who called Nathaniel. And we had that nice story about Jesus seeing Nathaniel under a fig tree, even though he couldn't physically see him. Um, well, there's no such added information in the version from Mark. It's a very, very brief story. So it starts out telling us that John the Baptist has been arrested, which might raise the question in your mind, it did in mine, how come John the Baptist was arrested? Well, remember King Herod. King Herod was not known for being a nice guy. Um, early on, he had little babies killed so that, so that there would be no competition for him from a Jewish king, um, except that Jesus escaped from that. So King Herod was what was called a tetrarch. He was the tetrarch of Judea, 
and his authority actually came from the Roman government. As long as everything stayed calm and peaceful and the Roman army didn't have to come in to take over, they would just leave the people alone and let them do whatever they wanted. King Herod did do some good things. He rebuilt the temple. He, um, he built his own home that was quite a castle. And, and similar to what happened in other Roman cities, he started building public works, places that people could go. Um, now, Herod was married, and he decided, as some men do, that he didn't really want that wife anymore. And so he divorced her. And then he took as his wife his brother's wife. His brother was Herod Philip. This woman's name was Herodias. So he had noticed Herodias, and, and so he divorced his wife and married his brother's wife, even though he was not legally free to do that. But you know, sometimes people in power kind of take the easy way around the law um, and, and do things that, that we might not approve of. Now, John <laughs> unfortunately decided to use that as an example in many of his sermons. You know, you think that you're living lawfully, but look, your very king has married his brother's wife against the law. They're committing adultery right here in front of everybody. Um, you might imagine that Herodias was not too happy to hear about that. And so she went to Herod and said, have that man arrested. Herod didn't really want to do that because he knew that John the Baptist had a large group of followers. Wherever he went, people would gather and he would preach to them and baptize them. Um, so you didn't really want to, to um, yank him off the streets and arrest him because it would look pretty bad. Um, and they were afraid there might be an uprising. So um, he was arrested. We believe he was arrested in about the year 27. Um, so that's the official story. John the Baptist was arrested because he was preaching against King Herod and his new wife. But there's also always in, in the world a subtext. And the subtext was that, that Herod was worried there would be an uprising. And he didn't want that to happen because then the Romans would come in and take over and his gig would be done. He wouldn't be able to collect all the money and, and do everything he wanted to do. Um, and that comes from the Roman historian Josephus. He said that, that John had gathered such a large group of followers that he was seen as a risk of a revolt against Herod. So they wanted him out of the way. Now the story continues. About a year later, after John had been arrested, there was a big party for Herod's birthday. Herodias had a daughter. Um, in one place in the Bible, it names her Salome. And Salome danced for the king when he was pretty far gone with drinking. Um, and he really liked her dancing a lot. He liked it so much that he promised he would give her anything she asked for. So her mother had been waiting for this moment, pulled her aside and said, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. What every teenage girl dreams of, right? The head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod was appalled at the idea, but since he had said, I'll give you anything you want, he felt obligated to do it, and he had John executed in the prison. Now, the gospel starts out all nice and sweet. Little baby Jesus, meek and mild in the stable and, and the, the angels in the sky and the star and the wise men. But now this is becoming a life and death thing. Jesus being Jesus, he already knows, will lead to his execution. Now the story in Mark, we're, we're going to go back to Galilee now. The story in Mark is a little different from the one in John. Jesus calls Simon Peter first. Um, excuse, excuse me, calls Simon Peter and his brother Andrew at the same time. They're in the boat fishing. And he says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of people, fishers of men. Um, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Then he calls James and John the sons of Zebedee. And these men left their nets behind while their father remained with his hired men and they followed Jesus. Now, you need to know something about the Jewish people at that time. They were not seagoing people. 
They didn't go out into the Mediterranean Sea. They did go onto the Sea of Galilee. Um, most of them couldn't swim, and drowning was pretty common. So later in the gospel, when it talks about Peter stepping out of the boat and walking on water, he probably would have drowned because he didn't know how to swim. Um, you need to know some things about the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is actually a freshwater lake. It's a pretty big lake, but it's not huge. Um, it is below sea level, and it's the lowest in, in altitude freshwater lake in the world. It's the largest lake in Israel, but it's really not that big. It's 13 miles long by 8 miles wide, which means that either from either north to south or east to west, you couldn't see across it, um, so it looked really big. But compared to a lot of lakes, um, Lake Erie, for example, you could fit the Sea of Galilee in Lake Erie about 100 times. Um, now, fishing around the Sea of Galilee was big business. There were hired men who fished, who would, who would fish using nets, and then, then there were the people who owned their own boats and owned the nets. They were the ones who made the really good money. Fishing was done by dragging the nets behind the boat and then hauling the nets and the fish into the boat. When they weren't fishing, they spent time repairing the boats and mending the nets. So James and John were part of their father's family fishing business. I, um, we, were, we were on vacation one time and I noticed this guy wearing a t-shirt and I, I couldn't quite read it, so I was probably looking a little long. I hope he didn't get disturbed by that. But what it said was Zebedee and Sons Fishing Company. <laughs> so it was based on this story. Jesus called his disciples by saying, follow me. He didn't sit them down and give them a big long sales pitch. Follow me and I'm going to turn you into something different. I'm going to make you fishers of men. You already know how to catch fish. I'm going to teach you how to catch people. Um, he called them and they did what he said. They followed. We don't know what they knew about him before receiving the call, but we do know that all of them came to know that he was the son of God. Following Jesus transformed them into men who could preach and teach and share good news in a way that drew others. And thousands of people through the years have been transformed by their teaching as well as the teaching of Jesus. So a very short story from the book of Mark. And sadly for me, not enough to build a whole sermon. But the lectionary gives us four readings every week. And the other reading that I wanted to talk about today is from, the, from Psalm 62. This is a psalm that's attributed to King David. So listen to the words. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. <coughs> Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. And steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Well, one of the most important things that Jesus taught to his followers was how to pray. Jesus prayed in a very personal way, referring to God as Father. Before Jesus, prayer was something that made people anxious. Jesus criticized the religious leaders of his time for making a big show of their prayers in public, and he told them that prayer was a private matter. In this psalm, 
David, who also had a close relationship with God, identifies some things about prayer that we need to take note of. First of all, he starts by talking about spending time in silent prayer, waiting to hear from God. Too often when we pray, we just barge right into it without giving God any chance to to speak to us. David says that God is solid and dependable. He calls God his rock, his salvation, and fortress, a thing that doesn't move and that you can count on. He says our honor and our deliverance come from God. He says that God is trustworthy and we can pour out our hearts to God. Now he says that we can't really rely on people. People aren't here forever. That's where he says people of low estate and people of high estate, they're really just air and they float upward. They're gone. He also says we can't rely on possessions, whether they could be stolen or extorted. Even if, if we accumulate great wealth, that doesn't equate to power. And you can't take it with you, as we all know. Power belongs to God, and our love also belongs to God, and God repays those who love him. Earthly power means very little because earthly power can be taken away. So I wanted to to tell you today some things that we can do (coughs) to pray more effectively. First of all, set a time to pray every day. Make it part of your daily schedule. Here at Trinity, we like to say that 7.30 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. are our favorite prayer times. Spend at least half of your prayer time in silence waiting to hear from God. Do what Jesus did. Get away to a private and quiet place. Turn off your TV. Don't throw things at me, but you can even turn off your phone and get away from any distractions. And then say what's on your mind. You can say it out loud. You can say it to yourself. Think of people you're concerned about and pray for them. And ask God for what you need. There's a simple acronym that you can use to help you. Think of the word pray. Each letter stands for a step in praying. P is for praise. Tell God what you've noticed about the world today. Praise God for what God has done in your life. P is for praise. R is for repent. We all do things we shouldn't, and we all fail to do things that we should. Tell God you're sorry for not living up to God's perfect plan for you. R is for repent. A is for ask. Think about what you really need. Ask God to meet your needs. Now remember that God isn't a magic genie in a bottle. God meets needs through other people. But once you've prayed, sometimes those needs do do, um, work out. And the Y stands for yield. Leave it all in God's hands. Jesus prayed, not my will, but your will be done. And we pray it in the Lord's Prayer. Um, when we pray that every week. Yielding means letting go of my control and letting God take over. You can thank God for taking care of you. So let's put it all together. P is for praise. R is for repent. A is for ask. And Y is for yield. Praise, repent, ask, and yield. It's a pretty effective way to pray. By doing that, you're praying in the right ways. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I heard a, uh, actually read a story about a man who had, had um, been at a church meeting, and the people were all talking about how, oh, God speaks to them all the time. And he thought, I've never heard God speak to me. So he was, he was leaving the meeting and he was driving by a convenience store and he felt this very strong pull to go into the store. And there was this kind of message in his mind that said, go buy a gallon of milk. He thought, I don't need a gallon of milk. I don't use a whole gallon of milk in a week or two. I don't need milk. And again, 
go in the store and buy a gallon of milk. Well, these people said, do what God tells you. Maybe that's what this is. So he buys a gallon of milk. Then he continues driving, and he's driving near a street he'd never gone on before, and this message comes to him. Turn right. He said, I don't need to go down that street. There's nothing there. Turn right. So he turned right. Okay, God, you're in control. I'll turn right. Then he hears, stop. Okay, so he stopped. And he notices that it, there are businesses, but there's only one house that has any lights on. So then he hears, go knock on the door. What is this all about? So he goes and knocks on the door. And nobody answers, so he's ready to turn away when he hears footsteps. And this man, wearing only a pair of jeans and looking very frustrated, opens the door. And, and he can, in the background, he can hear a small child crying. And um, the man says, what, what? What do you need? He said, well, I'm not sure that I need anything, but something told me that you might need this. And he hands the guy the gallon of milk. And the man began to weep. And he said, my wife and I were at, at our end. We have this baby. We haven't had any food all day. And we just said, if only we could get some milk, at least that would get us through the night. And here you are. That's how God works through people. Not all the time. But if we're open to it, and if we're willing to yield, actually to pray, repent, ask, and yield, then... We allow God to work through us, and beautiful things can happen. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 297, I Love to Tell the Story.
This is the time where we share some prayer requests. Um, I haven't heard a lot this week from anybody. I know that Ruth Casto was looking forward to warmer weather, so hopefully soon she'll be able to be here with us. As I was looking around the sanctuary today, I noticed several people that we haven't seen for a while who are here with us today, so welcome back. Um, we even had Judy Walzer in the sanctuary for nearly half of the service, so everybody give her a hard time when you go out and say, it was nice having you for the few minutes you were here. Um, I did get an update. Last week we talked about a young man named Tynan, who is 29. <clears throat> he is the nephew of Rick and Beth Haynes. He has been diagnosed with a progressive disorder of the bile duct, which is causing liver failure. Um, he's been transferred to the Ohio State University Hospital, and he is on the waiting list for a liver transplant. So very serious medical issues for Tynan. Let's continue praying for him and for his family. Um, and I'm going to start in the back. What other prayer requests do we have? And what's the last name? I'm sorry. Evans. Evans. The Evans family, Debbie's neighbor of 40 years, passed away yesterday. Yes. Diane Thede, who has cancer, final stage cancer. Diane Thede. Okay, Diane Thede, who has cancer. Virginia Burns, who's battling breast cancer. Virginia Burns, okay, with breast cancer. Anybody else back here? Okay. Okay, Antoinette Johnson going in for surgery, you said Tuesday? Okay. All right. We have had positive updates all week on Debbie Casanova. She continues to recover a little faster than they were hoping even, so that's always good news. Okay. Who else? Okay. We want to pray for Ann Lewis, who's still recovering from the flu and everything else that went wrong with her. And my cousin Jim Hobson is having surgery on Friday. We think it's for his back. Okay. Yes. Lee Smith, who is Carol Smith's mother-in-law, Gary's mother, um, will be moving. She's still in the same place, right? The same, same facility, but moving to a different part of it. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Let's have a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll pray. <clears throat> Most holy and loving God, a day like today makes us think that spring is on its way, but help us to remember that winter has not lost its grip and that we'll have more cold days before the warm days come. Lord, there are so many around us who are suffering from illnesses and difficulties and, and hardships that we hardly even know about. We are guilty of sitting near people each Sunday without really getting to know them and what they're going through. Help us to reach out, not, not every day, but every once in a while, to let people know that we care, to let them know that we know that they're hurting 
and we love them. Sometimes that's all it takes to get through a hard time. We know that many are struggling with addictions and with problems connected to those addictions, and we want you to help heal them, help be part of the solution, help, be, help them by being their higher power. Finally, O oh God, bless this congregation of your people as we move out, outward from this building and spread the gospel, as we become disciples, just like those fishermen from long ago. Help us to know how to cast the right kind of net to the right place. A net made of good news that the world needs so much. Amen. And this is the time that we give something back to God. Our verse verse from Deuteronomy says... Give freely and unselfishly, and the Lord will bless you in everything you do. O oh Lord, giving is an act of love, a way that we show our love for you and for your kingdom. Use these gifts and bless the hands that have given them. Amen. Our final hymn is number 336, Jesus, I Come.
Okay, you have to indulge me for one minute. There's a story told about a pastor who got very impassioned during his sermon. And it, the sermon was about Jesus is coming again. And so he would get to a point in the sermon and pound the pulpit and say, behold, I am coming. And then a few minutes later, behold, I am coming. And again, behold, I am coming. But he hit so hard that the whole thing tipped over and landed on a poor man in the front row. And he said, I'm so sorry. And the man said, well, you told me three times you were coming. I should have gotten out of the way. <laughs> Let's take the hand of someone nearby. Holy one, if we can't laugh together, then laughter shouldn't exist because joy is part of who you are. Your love surrounds us. Your warmth keeps us together heart to heart and hand to hand. Continue with us through this coming week, no matter what it may bring. Help us to be examples of your light in the world. Amen.